Garden trends are not inherently bad. Shockingly enough, they do come from a place of science and applied science for gardeners. But the context tends to be skewed by the time it gets to you. And ultimately speaking, plants don't care about affiliate links, aesthetics, or what pops off on the internet. So today's video, we're going to look at the 2025's worst garden trends, what needs to stay in 2025 for garden trends, and exactly why. Let's get into it. If you don't know who I am, hi, hello, my name is Ashley. I have a Bachelor's of Science in Soil Science, and I like to take said science and apply it to plants and soil here in your home garden. The comment section is the gate crew, and they also have a ton of insights, so go check out the comment section. And if you want more science-based information, then be sure to hit that subscribe button. So trend number one is that there is no single addition that could be made to your soil, to your plants, to your setup that will fix everything. I can say with some relative confidence that things like fish emulsion, compost teas, Epsom salts, sea salt minerals, raw dust, rock dust, all of these items are touted as the single ingredient that is just simply missing from your garden. And that's the reason why you have pests and the reason why you have disease and the reason why you have nutrient deficiencies. That could not be any further from the truth. In my short-lived time here on planet Earth studying soil and plants, I can tell you with relative confidence that plants very rarely are missing anything. The soil outside is very rarely missing any sort of micro or macronutrient. The actual source of nutrient stress, which then in turn does cause a higher likelihood of infection due to disease or makes the plant more susceptible to insects, is imbalance. An imbalance in the ratio of nutrients and what is present. This in and of itself can and will cause massive issues within your plant. So dumping more of something onto the garden is actually probably just going to cause more of an imbalance than help you out in any way, shape, or form. Any benefit that you see immediately after application is because you are bypassing the soil's natural chemical, physical, and biological cycles that need to, it needs to go through. And you're just giving the plant a direct shot of basically like Narcan to the system to get it going past what otherwise would be an imbalanced environment. So it's a band-aid on a big problem. And the big problem being imbalances due to inappropriate relationships between chemicals, biology, and the physics of your soil. For example, some salts are used for magnesium deficiencies. Now, this magnesium deficiency is very unlikely in your soil, in any soil for that matter, but what happens when we add the Epsom salt is that we actually cause a calcium deficiency. This results in thinner cell walls of our plants and even blossom and rot that doesn't seem to get better. So what you can do instead of jumping on the trend of XYZ product will fix everything is to actually look at the soil and work on the structure and the biology of it. And by structure, I have a ton of videos going through soil structure and what a healthy soil structure will look like. What you want to do is try to emulate that or get as close to that as possible. From a biological perspective, you can do the biology test that I've shown many of you how to do, and this will let you know if your soil is biologically active. If we have a chemically active and a biologically active soil, we have a healthy soil. And biology and chemistry are supported by the physicality of the soil. So that is actually what you want to focus in on rather than some sort of miracle product, which does not exist. If it did exist, soil scientists, agronomists, we wouldn't have a job. It just wouldn't, we wouldn't, it wouldn't be a thing. So that's why it's the whole field, fields involved in puns intended in soil fertility. Next one is fear-based chemical-free gardening. So there's a huge trend that everything is a chemical and if it's a chemical, it shouldn't be added. Now, everything is a chemical. Water is a chemical. Oxygen is a chemical. I mean, the ammonia, nitrate, nitrite, naturally occurring chemicals all exist. Now, the issue here is that if we are very scared of nitrogen fertilizer, for example, we can deplete our soil nutrients. We can cause greater imbalances. This means more yellow leaves, weaker plants, plants that are more susceptible to disease and pests, all because we believe that nitrogen is a bad chemical. Now, I want to really drive this home. Fertilizer, synthetic or organic, are end up being the same thing. The plant can't uptake a synthetic or an organic. 
It can't put a preference on synthetic or organic. Microbes in the soil don't even really care if it's synthetic or organic. If it's got nitrogen in it, it's going to go through the nitrogen cycle the same way anything else would. So when it comes to fertilizer, I actually would encourage you to pull back from that. I think pesticides, meaning insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, cheriocides, anything like that, you can obviously step back and look at it a bit differently because that is something you should look at a bit differently, organic or otherwise. I have a whole video on organic chemicals that are used for pests. So that's something separate to look at. But from the perspective of fertilizers, I would actually heavily encourage you guys to take a different look at it, particularly if we're talking container or closed system gardening, because these systems are more likely to struggle or be harmed by slower release formulas such as the organic. So chemical, chemical free. And when it comes to fertilizer, use that with caution. Trend number three is overloading containers. So there's a number of different reasons for doing this. Number one is you want to make for better drainage. So maybe you're going to put rocks in the bottom, you're going to put wood in the bottom, mulch, cut grasses, sands, whatever you can find in the bottom of the container. Other option is to actually make the container lighter because soil is so heavy. Maybe you fill the bottom with perlite things of that nature. Now, this does not help with drainage. It actually causes something called a perched water table. And this is something that you'll see in containers. This is actually something you will see in nature when our soil profile has rather abrupt transitions between different soil textures and types. And essentially what it is, is it's when the water runs from one material, in this case, it would be potting soil, down uniformly until it hits the next level, whether that level be rock, sand, mulch, grass clippings, you name it. What happens is it stops there and it continues to flood just the above area and kind of makes a strip of heavily saturated oxygen depleted zone. And if that zone is too close to the roots, then it actually will cause root hypoxia. So it will kill off the roots due to lack of oxygen. So if we want to go this route for ensuring that containers are going to drain properly, then we want to ensure that that new kind of transition space is actually lower in the container. If we're dealing with a shallower container, anything under like five gallons, I would say, I probably would not utilize this whatsoever. It has to be a larger container in size for it to make sense. This is going to help you in the long run. And while it may seem like it's going to be more difficult to stay away from overwatering, long term, it's going to make for happier, healthier plants. Trend number four is aesthetic gardening or kind of cramped quarters gardening. So I'm sure many of you have seen it before. Raised beds with several different plants. It's far from monocropped. And they're all kind of piled in together. Aesthetically, it looks very nice because you don't see much ground. You just see a lot of plant. It looks like it's heavily producing because it is so full of foliage and flowers, et cetera, and so forth. But the reality is that plants compete. They compete for nutrients in the soil. They compete for light. They compete for air movement and space just overall in general. If we look at Mother Nature, Mother Nature doesn't naturally pile a bunch of plants as close together as possible. There is some spacing there because that is what allows for those plants to succeed and become healthy. So for example, if we were to have tomato plants and we crown a whole bunch of tomato plants together, or we have tomato plants and then we intercrop with a bunch of different shorter plants, we can end up with an aesthetic looking patch, but we can also end up with a patch that is poor to set fruit. This is due to competition for water, which can in turn cause blossom end rot competition for nutrients, which in turn can cause flower drop, and ultimately sometimes competition for light, depending on if the size of the surrounding plants. So if you are continually having blossom and rot issues, if you're continually having low numbers of flowers and a whole lot of foliage, this may be the sign that you're packing too much into the space and you need to back off on the total number of plants that you are planting in your square foot garden method. Just because it can go together doesn't mean it should because it will reduce yield. Think of it this way. If someone who's gardening or farming on a large scale for cash, tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, et cetera, and so forth, if they're not cramming everything together, there's probably a reason for it because they want to make money. So if they can fit a tomato plant every 
half a foot, they're going to fit a tomato plant every half a foot, if it makes sense. If it's reducing their yields, if it's reducing the quality, if it's increasing disease, then they're not going to do that. So always follow what's people who make money off of stuff, what they're doing, and then you want to try and mimic that whenever possible because that's probably your best bang for your buck. Next trend is treating soil like a product and not like an ecosystem. So soil is constantly treated as though we can buy it and make it. So we can make it with organic compost. We can make it with rock dust, inoculants, you know, limestone to adjust the pH. We can make we can make soil, right? Well, the truth is no, that's not the case. And a stable soil, a healthy soil, is something that stabilizes over time. So while soil sometimes does need to be amended and corrected and fixed, if you continue to change and pivot nonstop, you end up resetting the clock on what would be a healthy soil. So what you want to do is you want to try to mimic physically a healthy soil. And then in turn, that will result in a chemically and biologically sound soil. It can take time. I'm talking two to three years before we're comfortable with the direction things are going. If we change it every single year, we're always just going to be stuck in this loop of soil that's just simply not working for us. And we want to try to avoid that as much as possible because it's expensive and it's frustrating. So simply put, the trends for 2025 mean that you don't need to purchase products to make it happen. You just have to gain a better understanding of what's already taking place. And then your garden will grant you goodness once you take all those factors into consideration. So if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button, like, hike, comment down below your 2025 trends you want to stay behind are. And I will talk to you next time. Bye.